That's right. As promised, I have Congressman Trey Gowdy on the air with us. And uh, how are you doing today, Congressman Trey Gowdy? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm very good. Listen, a year, a little over a year ago, you, you, you said something that I wanted to play for you to see how you felt about it now. So uh, <laughs> listen up here, please. You've got to be a rock star, Congressman Trey Gowdy. I think you're getting more exposure than the top rock star groups right now. Uh, well, um, I am the farthest thing you can be in life from a rock star. I'm just a middle-aged father of two and husband of one, but, uh, but I am a former prosecutor, and if there's anything good former prosecutors can do in Congress, it would be law enforcement-related issues. So uh, after Fast and Furious, I'm sure I will fade back to the anonymity I so richly deserve. <laughs> I doubt that. I, I'm sure something else will be coming down the pike. And then there's this clip from March 12th, I think it was. If presidents can turn off the very provisions that we pass, you know, in the oath that, that brand new citizens take, it contains six different references to the law. If it's good enough for us to ask brand new citizens to affirm their devotion to the law, is it too much to ask that the president do the same? If a president... If a president can change some laws, can he change all laws? We make law. And while you are free to stand and clap, when any president comes into this hallowed chamber and promises to do it with or without you, I will never stand and clap. When any president, no matter whether he's your party or mine, promises to make us, a constitutional anomaly and an afterthought. We make law. Uh, Congressman Trey Gowdy, that um, YouTube video has been seen 304, 300,000, over 300,000 times. What do you have to say, Trey? Are you fading into anonymity? Well, what I was thinking, Ann, was imagine how many people would have watched it had uh, a good public speaker given that speech. I, I work with people who write really good speeches. Imagine if Tim Scott had delivered that speech. We might be up around a million. Oh, Trey, I tell you what. I, you know, I, I thought that uh, the impassioning that you put out there is just phenomenal. I, I, I can't imagine how you could do anything more better. <laughs> than what you did that day as far as a speech. Well, I believe it, and it, it transcends politics. Um, it's one of those things, Ann, that hopefully, you know, I'm sure you have listeners that, that cross the entire political spectrum. Sure. And I would think what they would agree on is that this system our framers gave us and lots and lots of people have died in sacrifice for is worth rising above politics and i, I i'm i'm re i really it takes a lot to stun me but i am stunned when people who run for the legislative branch have so little regard for the branch that they run for i i i, I really struggle to understand that but um that is I, I had a that bunch of democrats come up to me afterwards and say that they they thought i was right <laughs> they still didn't vote with me but they thought i was right well, what is it going to take for that branch of the service to realize what their what their job is? Uh, the voters. The voters. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I say this um, full well understanding that there are some people that I serve with that are very good and decent people and are not motivated by their own reelection. But but the joke I like to, to ask folks in my district is what do elected officials want more than anything else in the world, including world peace and harmony? They want to be reelected. So if the voters said, you know, politics aside, the executive branch's job is to enforce the law. The legislative branch's job is to make the law and pass the law. We have a hearing tomorrow in the Supreme Court on the HHS mandate, the contraceptive mandate. Their job is to interpret the law and not make it. If people kind of rallied and said, that's the system that we bought into, and that's the system that we signed up for, and that's the system we're going to insist on, then people would get their acts together. 
you know, I, I, you're right on that. But I don't understand, Trey. I mean, I, the, the enforce, enforced law that you have put forth that passed the House last week, tremendous. Now, of course, it goes to the Senate, and I'm sure you expect nothing will happen with it. Well, I expect this. I There are pr- close to a dozen competitive Senate races in November. Okay. You've got Tommy Cotton in Arkansas, who, by the way, Ann was sitting right beside me when I when I made that that speech. And and Tommy's running for the U.S. Senate against an incumbent. And you can go around. I I can name a half dozen really really competitive Senate seats. And if people in those states decided, you know, this is going to be an issue, how you view the job of the executive branch and how you view the job of your own branch, we're going to make it an issue. Then. We won't get a vote between now and November, um, but if Republicans win the Senate, I can guarantee you we'll get a vote after November. So this this was more of an issue to put it on the table for the, for reelection for right now. It, honestly, and I, I wasn't talking to my colleagues when I when I said what I said on the House floor. I was talking to your listeners and the people who who. You know, may have been watching C-SPAN or may have wanted to see a clip afterwards. I I was talking to my fellow citizens because, you know, one of these days I'm going to be out of politics. I'm going to be listening to your radio show and and working and doing all the things that your listeners do now. But I'm still going to care about our country. And so I wasn't talking to people who were in politics. I was talking to people who were trying to raise their families and trying to work and play by the rules to get them fired up enough to demand of their elected officials that they actually do what they're supposed to do. Well, you, you certainly hit the nail on the head. I would be interested, Trey, why did they bring that one to the floor when they haven't brought uh, Tom Rice and the STOP Act up, since that only has to go to the House? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Ann, because Tommy Rice, and I said it in an earlier speech on the House floor, Tommy deserves a ton of credit. Uh, He did the legal research on standing. I I think what leadership would tell you is that you can always come back to a a resolution, which is what Tommy's was. It was a resolution that only has to pass one, one house. Correct. To make it as safe as it possibly could be from a constitutional standpoint, you obviously want it to pass both houses and be signed by the president. That makes your standing argument even better. But once we realize the Senate's not going to vote for it or not going to vote on it, Mm -hmm. then you can always come back to Tommy's resolution. So I think they view his as kind of a stopgap. We'll go with this one first, and if it doesn't work, we can always come back and try just the House passing it. But the safest thing to do from a, from a constitutional perspective with respect to standing is to have it pass both, both bodies and become law. Well, I, 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 if, if the Senate becomes Republican, how many stacks of bills are over there to be put forth when the Republicans take over? Since Harry Reid has trash canned so many as he has, uh, well over two hundred since I have been in Congress. Okay, and 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 I'm not naive enough to think that the president's going to sign all two hundred of those. But I'll tell you what it will do: it will give the people a chance when we pass it and the Senate passes it and he vetoes it. Then we'll have a real good understanding of what his and any subsequent Democrat candidates for presidents positions are on the issues. Right now, the president doesn't have to take any position because Harry Reid keeps him from having to veto a bill. I can't think of a single bill he's vetoed since he's been president. I could be wrong about that, but I can't think of one. Yeah. So when, when Nancy Pelosi talks about a do-nothing Congress, what she really means is a do-nothing Senate. And I'm not talking about the Republicans in the Senate because they have zero power. Right. Just imagine how much better the IRS investigation would be if the Senate were helping us with it and not thwarting us, or Benghazi, or the NSA, or anything else. 
if we had a little bit of help from the Senate. You know, the Senate gets very mad when they think people are listening to their phone calls or reading their emails. They don't get quite so mad when they think they're listening to yours. But but just imagine if there were a Republican chairman of judiciary, what progress we could have made on Fast and Furious. Right, and and that that is the next question I wanted to bring up. It looks like through this election that the Democrats are going to skate on the IRS and on Benghazi. And why are we not, is that why we're not able to make more? After we get through this election, will more happen? Well, you know, IRS is, is especially troubling for me because there are criminal allegations that can only be handled, you know, not to go back to the floor speech, but the executive branch is the only group that can enforce the law. There are no prosecutors in Congress. <laughs> They're former prosecutors. <laughs> right, yes. We, we can't indict, we can't arrest, we can't prosecute. Only the executive branch can do that. So we need another attorney general. I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't want to get off on the side street, but, but you know, Lois Lerner <laughs> is less scared of the Department of Justice than she is a committee of Congress. She's already talked to them. She just won't talk to us. So, yes, it would get better, but it won't be all the way better, in my judgment, until you have an administration. You know, in my judgment, I hope I think that has to be a Republican administration. But I guess in theory, you could have a Democrat in the White House who said, you know what, these issues are serious enough that we're going to turn over all the documents because that's what we need. And I mean, I, I'm tired of hearing from law school professors and and think tank policy experts. I want to hear from witnesses and I want to see the documents. And if the executive branch won't give us the documents. I mean, that's how you prove something sure. with emails and memos, and this is when you said this. It's tough to do if you don't have the, the evidence, if you don't have the documents. Well, why, why are you, I mean, you started with Lois Lerner. Are you going to be going back and going to some of the lower echelon people and start pulling them in? We've already done it. We, we've already talked to, in fact, that's how we kind of built, you know, a, a Something of a case against Lois Lerner was by talking to people that she worked with. But the reality is, and had that hearing gone forward two weeks ago, you would have heard a series of questions just simply using Lois Lerner's own words that would have been very difficult for her to explain. We do have some of her emails. Now, in the last week, the IRS has agreed to give all of her emails to another committee of Congress called Ways and Means. But, but that's, what, six, nine months after we asked for it? Sure. And, and by the time we go through all of it, we'll be sitting in the summertime. That is not the ideal time to capture the public's interest is when people are on vacation and out of school. And then before you know it, we're sitting in the November elections. Exactly. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I come from a... I come from a system that when you send a subpoena to a telephone company asking for phone records, you get them within two days, not two years, two days. That's why I said, do you think the Democrats are going to skate on the IRS? It's going to go right through the election, isn't it? Well, you know, there are a couple of ways that cannot happen. I'm going to be uncharacteristically optimistic for a second. Okay. Um, if pressure built to have a special prosecutor, um, then I think uh, Democrats in the Senate, because they are obsessed with holding on to the Senate. They realize they're not going to win the House. But if in some of these swing states, and, and keep in mind, some of these senators are running in states where Mitt Romney won and won big. So if the Democrats thought that they were going to lose the Senate because of what the IRS did, then, yeah, they may throw a Hail Mary pass and, and say, look, appoint a special prosecutor. They will do anything to hold on to the Senate, including things that they don't think they'll do right now if the people demand it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So that, that could come about if they thought they were going to lose. 
Now, but that didn't work with that hasn't worked with Benghazi. It hasn't worked with Benghazi, but they're they're well. What's today? Monday, Wednesday morning. Um, I, I am part of a a working group on Benghazi. It is not a sp- special select committee, which I also support, but but it is two members from from all four of the committees that have jurisdiction, and and we are beginning to meet. And my instructions were. Gowdy, bring the questions that have yet to be answered. So I spent the weekend developing the questions that I am asked all the time and the questions that I can't answer. So Benghazi is not dependent upon a special prosecutor. Benghazi is dependent upon us having access to witnesses, which we could do with a subpoena tomorrow. And and without boring all of your listeners to death, one of the frustrations of Washington is that there is there is not always uh, a a great working relationship among different committees, even if there are Republicans at the head of all of those committees. People have a tendency to uh, to kind of you don't want to say protect their own turf, but that's exactly what it is. So what you need is a group that is willing to work across these different jurisdictional lines. I'm on oversight, which means I do not have access to CIA information. That's House Intelligence. And I don't have access to the Department of Defense because that's House Armed Services. And Jeff Duncan is on Foreign Affairs, but, but I don't have access to everything that Jeff has access to. But what we need is, is, is a group that has access to everything. So there are no blind spots and no missing links in Benghazi. I am more confident that Benghazi will have staying power than I am the IRS. Hmm. Interesting there, Trey. So, so on the uh, on the IRS, um, why was the IRS picked to implement the Affordable Care Act or be the overseer? I guess we should say. Uh, Lord only knows. <laughs> I, 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 that's a great question. It would be better than any answer I could come up with. <laughs> I, I guess they were looking because there is this, you know, tax that's not a tax that they argued wasn't a tax, and the IRS is, is the entity that is charged with enforcing taxes. I guess that's why they went that route. They certainly didn't want to give that power to the FBI because that would make people even more suspicious than they are, and that you know raises criminal. Sanctions. Although the IRS also has a criminal investigation division, but um, if I were a betting man, I would bet because of this this fine that they claimed was not a tax that we now know is a tax has to be collected, and the IRS is the group that does that. Okay. Hmm. But but but, but have, I, I I never fail to remind people I was not in Congress when that thing passed. Well, by the way, have you signed up for the affordable health care? No, ma'am. I had my own insurance um, until they until they said you can't have a policy like the one that I have, and I am now on my wife's policy. I see. Okay, so you haven't. I think Mick. I think Mick has. He has. I talked to him uh, last week, and he was telling me what a boondoggle it was. You know, with their triplets. One of the three boys is not yet covered, and they were trying to figure that out when I talked to him on Friday. Well, the last time I talked to Mick, he was trying to figure out whether or not to um, whether or not to apply in the District of Columbia or in South Carolina. Um, I think Tim, um, and, and then the issue is the subsidy, which I know Tim has refused to take. I think Senator Graham has refused to take. I, I haven't had federal health insurance since my first year in Congress. I I bought my own for two, and now, of course, I can't buy that policy anymore because it didn't conform. So uh, uh, I'm very grateful to my wife, uh, who is a public school teacher, um, for grudgingly adding me to her policy. Well, there you go. Hey, by the way, was that through the uh, federal government that you bought it up there, or the first two? No, years? no, no. Who me? Yes, you. Oh no, I I, I went I went on private. the on the private market and uh, and bought an individual policy, and in and as you know, I'm no spring chicken, so uh, it, it was. Uh, it, it wasn't but cheap. You, but you know what, Ann? I mean, it, 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 there 
lots of your listeners have to do the exact same thing. They, they have to purchase their own. I mean, lots of people get it from their employer, but, but I decided I wasn't going to do that. And, no, I went Blue Cross Blue Shield and bought an individual policy with, with a high deductible. Right. Um, and, and, and that's what I wanted. But that policy is, well, <laughs> they said it was no longer going to be available, remember, because it was a nonconforming policy. And then they changed their mind and said they'll get it, give you an extra year. But by then, I had already decided to go another route. Yeah, I think that was a useless thing that they put out there after everybody's policy had been canceled. Oh, you can keep it for another year. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I knock on wood. Um, I, my father's a physician, so when I do get sick, I, 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 I go to him, or or I just tough it out. But but I've got lots and lots of friends that have kids with pre-existing conditions, uh, or they themselves have pre-existing conditions, and um, I, I cannot I cannot overstate um, how bad the rollout, the implementation, and the reality of this health care law has been for the people that I have talked to. I think one of the biggest things, Trey, is you think you you know like when you used to have insurance, you paid you paid your part, and then the insurance company paid their part. Now, now if you haven't met the deductible, which is five six thousand dollars, whatever it is, you have to pay that up front. I had somebody just went to the hospital; they had to pay before they would treat them because they hadn't met their deductible. It is going to be, if it has not already been, a huge eye-opener, and that's just the direct consequences. The indirect consequences of losing hours or people not expanding their business because of increased health care costs. You know, and I, I, I really hope at some point we can get to a model where people do own their own insurance. They don't get it from their employer. Uh, just like they own their own health insurance and auto insurance and homeowners insurance, that we can get to that point that it's portable, you can take it wherever you want to take it, and and that you have an agreement with the insurance company, you're not going to be canceled if you get sick. Uh, so I, I, I think we can get there, um, but, but we're going to have to watch this so-called Affordable Care Act implode upon itself before we can. Sure. I guess that's why we you want the uh, law enacted as it was enacted. Well, you know, it'd be great if we could pass laws and get the benefit of telling people we passed it without ever having to deal with the consequences of the reality. Uh, that'd be a great job if you could get it. <laughs> but but that's not the way it's set up. And and uh, and I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, look, look, this is why that Enforce Act to me is so important. Let's assume you're a senator and I'm a senator and we're in different parties and we negotiate a bill and there's some things in it you don't like and some things in it I don't like, but we, we agree to do it because overall we're okay with it. And if my party is in power and my president just enforces the part I agreed to without enforcing the part you did, because he just decide, he or she just decides they're not going to do it. Well, then what's the use in negotiating anymore? Sure. It, it really, I mean, without, without sounding hyperbolic, it really does threaten your system of government if you can pick and choose which laws to enforce. I, I couldn't agree with you more, more Trey. And I just find it uh, phenomenal that we are still dealing with this and nothing has come of it other than... He, President Obama keeps doing what he's doing. And he keeps saying that, you know, his heart's in the right place. And, and you know, I'm not smart enough to judge people's hearts. I suspect it's a little bit of political motivation, not to be cynical. But but we're not a country based on good intentions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there you go. <laughs> that's not who we are. Yeah, what is it? The road is paved with good intentions? Uh, yes, the road uh, to a bad, hot place is paved with good intentions. Oh, I, there you go. I, That's right. I heard that a lot growing up. Yeah, me too. Um, well, let me ask you one last question here. By the way, everybody, you're listening to WCRS right here in Greenwood. This thing with the Internet, giving up the Internet, are you up to speed on this? Because I am I'm frightened by what they're talking about here. Uh, I'm not as up, as up to speed on it as I'm going to be in 48 hours. 
Um, okay. I was asked several times over the weekend about it, and, and my ability to comprehend what happened in the past in terms of the U.S. kind of overseeing it uh, versus what the alternative is, you, you know, and I always think in terms of, of piracy and, and acts of fraud committed over the Internet, sure. uh, you know, people thinking that they're buying medicine at a cheaper price and they're really getting something that's either a placebo or not good for them at all. Um, I, I prosecuted child pornography cases, uh, which are almost exclusively now over the Internet. So I am very interested in who is going to be um, overseeing it from a, a from a criminal standpoint. Uh, so I'll know more about it next time you and I talk, but uh, it, it, it happened – I guess in the last 10 days, I'm not on a committee of jurisdiction, um, but when I get up there later on this evening, I, I, I'm going to find somebody who knows more than I do about it to, to tell me what the issues are. Sure. Okay. Well, I was just curious because I think this is uh, kind of scary what they're talking about. We could just be uh, doing a, like a G7, only it would be for the Internet, right? Well, I, I am I, – I am, um, <laughs> You go back to the League of Nations and the United Nations, and I, I am wary of anything where the United States uh, surrenders its autonomy uh, to a group uh, that can't even uh, vote to sanction Iran. So I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that. Uh, on the other hand, the WWW does stand for the World Wide Web. Uh, whether or not you're going to have a, a U.S. intra-web, I, I, that is – that is something that I will know more about next time you and I talk. But the, the notion of surrendering American autonomy and sovereignty, uh, so Namibia uh, and what used to be Burma uh, can have the same number of votes we have, I'm not interested in that. Me either. And um, I understand you are running again, yes? I have filed, uh, yes. I, I've, I filed last week, and... Um, so that will be uh, I, I will be asking uh, the folks in this district uh, to give me another two year contract and um, uh, and I to my knowledge nobody else has filed yet but you know Congress is at seven percent in the public approval poll so my guess is people aren't beating the door down to join a group that that, that is that unpopular. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> but um, I also understand you support the term limits. Well, I do believe in term limits, and term limits can be imposed by any number of people, including the person himself or herself, and term limits can most assuredly be imposed by the voters. So I, I've, I've met plenty of people in politics who had a number in their mind, but that was a different number than the voters had in their mind. <laughs> so the voters always win that, but I, I do, particularly in my district, and there are so many people that could do the job and could do a really, really good job and in many cases do a better job, I, I, I do think um, that at least for me, I'm not speaking for anyone else, but for me, um, there is something um, historically appropriate about serving your people and then coming back home and, and watching, um, watching someone else have that honor. I understand. I understand. So I go back to my final question here for you today. Um, I will go back to the anonymity I so richly deserve, Congressman Trey Gowdy. I don't think you're into anonymity yet. Well, I I got to give I got to give credit. I, I worked with a prosecutor named David Stevens one time, and and David's still a prosecutor, and he's the best prosecutor I have ever seen in my life. And he said that about twenty years ago, and I remembered it, and it seemed appropriate. Uh, you know, life kind of ebbs and flows, and 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 one day, uh, particularly with social media, one day, you know, your kids may see a YouTube of you, but you know, a week later. Uh, it's Trey who, um, so it, it, it all ebbs and flows, and you kind of you have to ground yourself in things that last forever. And social media, and YouTube, and Twitter, and Facebook, uh, while a lot of people enjoy it, um, it doesn't last forever. And th there are some issues I can help on, but there are a number of issues that if we were talking about those, 
um, there wouldn't be any YouTubes because uh, I don't I don't know enough to talk for five minutes about them. So I'm uh I'm a husband and a father who right now is just blessed to serve in Congress, and one of these days soon enough I'll just be a husband and a father. Oh, Congressman Trey Gowdy, I always enjoy talking to you. Thanks so much for calling us this morning, Trey. God bless you. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye.